Good morning from the United States and midday Europe and Africa and evening Asia and Australia. Welcome to day three of the Aspen Global Congress on Scientific Thinking and Action. My name is Aaron Mertz. I'm director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society program and one of the chairs of this Congress. And good morning, afternoon, evening to you all. My name is Natalia Pasternak and I'm the co-chair and the president of the Institute Question of Science here in Brazil. We're thrilled to welcome you here today. This is um, a conference of about 100 science communicators and advocates from over 50 countries. And we've been able to open up the, uh, the panel discussions to the public. And we're thrilled today to present a very global panel on the topic of dousing the fires of climate change denial. Natalia will introduce our session chair. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our chair, Tim Manham from the Australian Skeptics. Tim, please, the show is yours. Well, thank you very much. And uh, good day from Australia. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for letting us start at an earlier hour from Australia's point of view. I know that people in California are probably 3 a.m. in the morning, so that's tough. <laughs> Been there. Anyway, my name is Tim Mendham. I'm Executive Officer and uh, Editor for Australian Skeptics Inc. Uh, we're the second oldest skeptical English language group in the world, and we publish a, a magazine, plug for the magazine, which is the second oldest English language uh, skeptical magazine in the world as well. And we've been going for 40 years. Um, and like most skeptical groups, we started off doing the things that skeptics do, which is the fun stuff like UFOs and Loch Ness monsters and that sort of stuff. But over the years, it's moved into the more serious uh, areas as you know, and the image we have is of more serious things into areas like the alternative medicine, serious sort of psychic ripoffs and climate change. These are areas which have major impacts on people's lives, whereas UFOs and Loch Ness monsters are pretty harmless. But this stuff is serious. So that's what we're talking about today. And I'm really looking forward to this. Um, our panelists are quite amazing. We have uh, John Cook, who's lately of the USA, but is now back in Australia, having spent these two weeks of quarantine to make sure he's, he's COVID free in Australia. Francois Marie Briand from France, uh, Lena Yassin of Sudan, and Haja Kamlichi, hope I've pronounced that right, Kanja, sorry, Haja Kamlichi from Morocco. Now, these, I'm a journalist, I'm just a lowly journalist. So these people have uh, quite amazing qualifications and experiences um, far beyond my, my ken. So I will actually let them introduce themselves rather than my going through a lengthy process of saying they've done this, that and the other. Uh, I'll also be asking them during this round robin procedure when we go one to the next for them to give a very short outline of the situation where climate change in their countries. Um, and apparently it's very, very different, the attitudes and the government actions. For instance, in Australia, we started off really well, actually, in the uh, 2007, there was a, an election which was largely based on climate change policy, uh, a progressive uh, Labor government, which was all in favour of sort of doing something, and a conservative uh, government that was in power at the time that was not that keen. The, the, the progressive got into power, on the basis of climate change policy and the prime minister at the time described climate change policy as the greatest moral, economic and social challenge of our time. Unfortunately, his actions and the government's actions were stymied by on both sides, by the conservatives who said such action is unwarranted and uh, too, too expensive, too difficult, too disruptive. And on the other side, by the Green Party, which thought the policy wasn't tough enough. And so in other words, Australia's chance at actually having a decent climate and climate change policy was stymied on both sides. So unfortunately, that meant that the government didn't do its job, if you like, and uh, eventually lost power to the Conservatives. And uh, from there on, we haven't progressed very far. The uh, Conservative government as it is, has a lot of people in it who are climate change deniers. They basically dismantled a lot of the programs that was uh, underway under the previous government. Uh, it's a, they're on a, currently on a knife edge uh, majority in the government. So anyone who's a bit outspoken on climate change has more of an influence than they should. So unfortunately, we haven't progressed very far. We're a mineral rich country. Uh, we rely heavily on uh, iron ore and coal for our experts, exports. Most of our um, power is, is coal fired. There is some hydro 
and growing renewables, but with largely uh, coal-fired power. And so therefore, was, the fear of the Conservative government is that if we reduce coal, or if we reduce uh, change to renewable energies, we're going to wipe out an entire industry, which is going to happen anyway. I should add, actually, that the recently appointed head of the OECD, uh, Matthias Cormann, is a member or was a member of that Conservative government. He was a finance minister and he was known for his dismissal of climate change regulation and policy. He was involved in dismantling a lot of the stuff that was done by the previous progressive government. Uh, he has called climate change policy a, a, an expensive hoax. Um, and now that apparently he's all in favour of climate change action. So he apparently has done a U-turn, but he's now running the OECD. So it's an interesting uh, position that he's come from. But overall in Australia, we have a federal government, that's over the whole country, which is doing very little. It has no real energy policy. It refuses to commit to a near rosette emission uh, by 2050. It says it would like to go there, but it's sort of no firm commitment. We have state governments that are doing more. They're more active, moving towards renewable energies uh, where they can, having stricter climate control um, regulation. The private sector, which is stronger still, which is asking for an energy policy from the federal government, and so far not getting it, but they've been pushing forward with trying to re renewables. And the public, which is generally accepting of climate change. And we have a very high rate of uh, solar panels on houses in Australia. About 21% of Australian houses have solar panels on the roof to provide their electricity. Part of that was because the electricity prices were so high but uh, it actually indicates that there is a strong feeling about renewables in Australia. So that's the Australian situation. But now what I'd like to do is move on to John. Uh, I'll give a little brief. Uh, John founded the Skeptical Science website, which is a major source of information on um, climate change, uh, the issues, the science, and also a major sort of site for debunking misinformation. Um, highly recommend, if you haven't already seen that, I don't know why but it's highly recommended anyway. But John, I'd like to ask you to describe yourself. Now you've come back from the USA. What's it like there as if we don't know, right? And also you are in, in a 2013 paper, I think it was, that uh, you were the lead author of a paper that was published, which brought up the 97% consensus number statistic about that the 97% of uh, climate, uh, sorry, of climate scientists, climatologists, support the idea that climate change is real. Now that's been contentious, if you might say, in some areas, obviously climate change deniers have uh, fought against that. But so if you'd like to do briefly about yourself, USA situation, and if you could answer that before then moving on to our next panelist. Thank you. John, I think your um, connection might be frozen. Um, Tim, do you want to go on to the next pairing in case John doesn't come back right away? Yeah, sure, if you want to, yeah. That's um, me. Uh, yeah, Francois, hi, how are you? Okay. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> I'll let John get on to his, on his stuff later. Okay, can I ask you the question? Uh, a little, oh. brief, a little <laughs> brief thing about you, who you are. Okay, um, basically, I, I, am, uh, I am a climate researcher. I have been a climate researcher for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I did uh, um, participate to the writing of the fifth IPCC report that came out uh, in 2013. And I'm also here because I'm the president of the uh, skeptic organization in France. And we have a journal that I can show here, Science and Pseudoscience. And it's also that you have a few uh, issues uh, behind me. Uh, therefore, sort of, in, what's the situation like in France at the moment for climate change? Actually, it's uh, it's pretty good, I would say. Uh, if you had asked me the question about uh, 15 years ago, I would have told you that it was uh, really bad. I mean, maybe uh, similar to uh, to what you have uh, right now in in Australia. 
Like uh, actually, we had a, a research uh, mixer who was a former uh, scientist and a pretty good scientist actually, but not not in climate. And he was very much a climate climate skeptic, and he, he just said uh, awful lies about it. But but that's over. That's definitely over. There is not a single political party that uh, uh, that denies uh, climate change and the. Uh, the, the government today is uh, taking climate change really seriously. Uh, we have a ser a serious laws that, that, that try to reduce or carbon uh, or carbon emission. So all that is, is pretty good. I mean, I, I won't say it's perfect. I mean, there are still a few uh, individuals that, uh, that that claim that uh, climate change is not true or that it's not so so important, but it's really mar marginal. Uh, there is one big question in France right now is about nuclear because uh, you certainly know that uh, that France is one uh, is uh, one of the country with the, the largest share of uh, of nuclear uh, in France and uh, some uh, and there is really a debate about whether we should continue uh, with, with nuclear uh, because it's uh, it's good for for the climate and actually uh, some other uh, claim that we should uh, in fact increase. Uh, the, the share of nuclear, uh, but that's not the, the majority. The majority thinks that uh, we should actually decrease the share of nuclear, even though uh, it's uh, it's good for the climate. But there are there are other issues about nuclear, as as, as you know. But uh, okay, so so the, the the debate about how we should tackle climate change turns a lot about the, the, the nuclear issue, which in my opinion is really a pity because uh, even though we do have a lot of nuclear in France, still 80% of our energy uh, is based on fossil fuel. And that's the, uh, that's on what we should really concentrate at present. And that's not what what, what is happening. Okay, and now sort of, uh, you've uh, played a role in the IPCC, right? So uh, you've been a contributor to that. How has that experience been for you? Well, it was. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, it was uh, it was natural. You know, I, I was so much uh, involved in the in the climate research, but also I, I at that time, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, 10, 10 or fifteen years ago, I was also very much involved in the in the public uh, public debate. At that time, I was very much uh, fighting uh, cl climate denialism in France, and I, I did realize. Uh, that IPCC was extremely useful to fight against uh, climate denialism because you could always refer to a hey, this is the scientific consensus on uh, and look I mean all the the climate researchers have been uh, pulled together uh, on and that's what they, they conclude. And they do not conclude one thing. I mean sometimes they say okay for for this we we are certain. But there are also some uh, things that we are, uh, there are large uncertainties. Like if I, I want to give a, an example, I mean, it's um, all the climate scientists are positive that there will be an increase of the temperature in the future. On the other hand, as for the precipitation, uh, first of all, it very much depends on the region, but also uh, there, there are large uncertainties. Some climate models said that uh, the, the precipitation will increase over Amazonia, and some other climate models said that, that precipitation will decrease there. So we have to admit that uh, there are uncertainties, and this is well reported in the in the IPCC report. Okay, so this this is why I mean I, I thought that it was um, ex the IPCC report were extremely useful to fight climate denialism that I decided to uh, to um, to volunteer uh, to to contribute to the report and, and so it was a nice experience and, and so I, I work with many colleagues like like we are uh, working uh, doing today you know with a lot of international exchanges uh, video conferences uh, was not as prevalent as it, as it is today but we had a, a few meeting by, by phone that worked uh, really well also and so we were able at the end to uh, to, to make that that report where well, that was the fifth IPCC report and I believe that this report was uh, really important both for uh, the public but also for for people like myself I mean uh, because it, I know about climate I know something about the climate but I'm not a specialist of everything like I do not know so much about the the, the climate the climate of the past and if I'm if I want to know something about that I know where to find the information and then also when I have to fight a great climate denialism, sometimes I have a very specific question or a very specific criticism, then I can go to the report and I can see what is the scientific consensus on this particular question. It's extremely useful, really. 
to have, I mean, sort of, uh, this whole Congress is about science communication, right? And about sort of, we, we, I would go out on a limb and I would suggest that everybody here agrees that climate change is a reality, right? If not catastrophic climate change, but I think that's a fair assumption in this thing. But how effective has, do you think the IPCC has been in communicating the issues and the realities to the general public? Well, maybe I'm biased. So, you know, we all have to be extremely uh, careful about biases. Uh, I may be biased because, you know, I live uh, in a community of uh, climate researcher. And so everybody uh, around me knows about the IPCC report. And therefore I feel like it has been extremely important and it has been extremely useful actually to, to, uh, to communicate about the science of climate change. And actually it's something uh, that I always uh, often say that I would like to see uh, uh, the, the equivalent to an IPCC report on climate to other subjects. Maybe we should have also an IPCC about vaccine. We should have an IPCC about uh, the impact of pesticide on health. We should have uh, an IPCC about the uh, alternative medicine, you know, so because uh, because this report, I feel, has been extremely useful to, to, to provide, to tell what is really the consensus on that. And, and for me, that I'm not a specialist on, on pesticides, for instance, and it's difficult for me to, to, to know what really what people, what the specialists know about it, what is really the impact on, on, on the health of people, on, on the environment. Uh, so... I, Okay, so I, I think that IPCC has been extremely useful and I wish there was the equivalent of IPCC to on other subjects. I think it sounds like a very good idea and I know that was brought up in some of the earlier breakout sessions actually, that it'd be good to have su such a good um, time. We have uh, one minute remaining. Uh, what would you like to see happen in France? Um, so first of all, as I said, uh, in France, the situation about the climate change denialism is, is pretty good. So uh, I, I wish it, were, it was uh, the same in, uh, in other countries. But now that we all agree that there is uh, really a, a danger of climate change, the question is, what do we do about it? And that's not so clear. I mean, uh, uh, I mean first of all, we have to decide whether it is the most important da danger that we are uh, facing, or maybe it's biodiversity. Some others say that the biodiversity is actually more, a more, uh, a more important danger at the short term. And also, if we agree that climate change is, is very the most important danger, what do we do about it? I mean, should we uh, try to go for full nuclear or for full renewable, or whether we, sh whether we should uh, lower very much our standard of living? And that's a real question. And for instance, uh, should we all stop uh, taking airplanes? Because we all know that airplanes, you know, is a large contribution to climate change. So do we agree that we should stop airplanes at present? I'm not sure that we all agree on that today. It's a more congresses like this. Okay, okay, Francois, thank you very much. Um, John, if you can hear me, we'll get back to you later uh, when Haja sort of talks to you and we'll drag in those questions I asked then. So thank you for your patience and I know there was a major conspiracy going on to keep John off air, uh, but we have dealt with that anyway, so it's okay. So uh, Francois, if I can now um, leave you to um, bring up Haja, if yep. she can come up now. No, Lina, actually. I'm, oh, sorry, Lina, sorry. To, to Lina. My apologies, yeah. okay, I'm a bit so thrown if off could, If Lina could uh, put on the Lina, camera. okay, so Francois, hey, nice it's all yours. You. Thank you, Lina. Lina. Lina, you have to turn on your microphone also. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, so Lina, please uh, tell, tell us all about yourself. I know that you have a very exciting stories about, to tell. Thank you, Francois. Um, so my name is Lina Yassin. I'm, I'm a climate activist from Sudan and I work as a, the Middle East and North Africa programs manager at Climate Tracker. Uh, we are an international organization that uh, aims to empower young communicators across the world to better communicate climate issues. And we do that by um, conducting capacity building activities, uh, be it workshops, be it online mentorships, courses, developing materials for people and participating in um, the international com um, climate conferences, specifically the COPs. So I have been following the UNFCCC COP since 2016. And I hope that I will be able to continue, be it virtually or in person. Excellent. Um, can you tell us a few words about the, the status of uh, climate change, climate change dynamism in your country? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, it's it's a complicated question for Sudan because I'm not sure if um, all of people here know, but um, before 2019, Sudan didn't really wasn't really in the international space. We had one government um, for 30 years, uh, which was a corrupt um, authoritarian government that didn't really care about anything but making money and exploiting the country's um, uh, basically resources. So climate change didn't surface at all. It wasn't one of the priorities and the country was facing a lot of um, challenges. Um, the economic was collapsing. It is still collapsing. And we had major social challenges. We had a lot of um, conflicts and civil wars either arising or on, on, the, on the verge of breaking. So climate change wasn't a thing. And when I started um, climate activism in 2016, I found it really hard to get to mobilize people uh, to join the cause because their response would be, okay, it, it sounds like an important issue, but I don't really have, I, I need to worry about my daily income. And this doesn't sound like something that impacts my daily income. So I would rather focus on that. So the level of climate awareness, uh, I would say from my own experience since 2016 was extremely low, uh, but now it is finally surfacing to the, um, it's finally surfacing. Uh, we, we now have a new government and it's a transitional government that will stay in place for the next four years. Uh, they came in late 2019 and environment was one of their priorities, but um, we all know that uh, in early 2020, the COVID hit and that created multiple social and economical challenges so the government has been putting out fires ever since they came. In September 2020, we had ex uh, historic floods that impacted half a million people. So they had to also respond to that event, help the impacted people. So they haven't really uh, set up any clear um, action points or plans for tackling climate change or even just raising climate awareness. So I would say the climate conversation um, is still yet to develop in Sudan. It's not that advanced yet. Okay, but we have to remind also that uh, Sudan is very little responsible for climate change. I mean, compared to the other countries today. So, so maybe climate change for you is a question of mitigation rather than uh, responsibility. I think we, we have to be aware, aware of that. Uh, okay, so, so, so then the question is that basically you are, you are a journalist and so you have to, uh, to try to, to, to generate this, uh, this uh, climate awareness. Uh, but you, you also speak to different um, le level of uh, understanding. So, and especially sometimes you, you talk to, to children. So how do you adapt your communication to your various audiences? Well, it's extremely complicated, especially now with our work at Climate Tracker. We work with people from different countries and we need to understand that every country is different. And even within one country, you would have multiple audiences and each audience would require a completely different approach to any topic that you're trying to basically tell them about. So one of the main elements that climate journalism um, is about is basically about identifying your audiences, understanding them really well and understanding what makes what they, what they are interested in. So for example, if, um, if I am to write an article in Sudan about how climate change is the reason behind the historic um, floods that happened last year that impacted half a million people, if I start my article or if my title is about this is how climate change caused the September 2020 floods, I'm sure no one's going to read it or at least very few people are going to read it because it obviously sounds like a very scientific um, article and people in Sudan, the majority of people in Sudan don't have that um, strong background in science and therefore they're not interested. So what we usually tell people to do is that, especially if you're trying to aim, uh, if you're aiming to raise the general awareness across the public, you would try to target their feelings. So if you look at the human side of climate change and try to familiarize it. So if you take a, um, a story about a family that lost their houses or how um, climate change, um, that those floods has impacted a specific family and just tell their story, this is gonna be more relatable to people because it's a human story and this family could be them in the next floods. And then what you could do is um, by, by starting your article in that way or by framing your article in that way, you, you have now managed to attract people to read the article. And then you can introduce scientific information because they, they, you have their attention now. So you can choose scientific inter, uh, inter, uh, information and try to simplify it as much as possible so that it doesn't draw people away from the coast. You need people to understand that climate change is real and that climate science is real but you also need to be very careful about the narrative that you use. And this is one of the challenges uh, that we usually face. Also children, we can't just say that children um, across the world need a specific way to 
talk about climate change because the level of awareness is completely different. So I would say children and in, in, in the West, um, especially the Friday for Future movements, um, they are a lot more aware of climate change and a lot more of the urgency of it. While children in developing countries may not have heard of the issue or may know very little about it. And that's because of the, the situation that they live in and the, the, the priorities in the country that they live in. So some children are worried about getting access to school, getting access to education. I can't just come and say, hey, you should worry about climate change. So we also need to be very sensitive about how we communicate with people. Okay, that's fascinating. And uh, you, you said that okay, there is a, a need for urgent, uh, urgent action. So do you think that we can actually use the science of climate change to encourage this, uh, this urgent action? Well, I think we need to be careful about how we use science to encourage action. So I've seen this multiple times um, in international media across the world. Uh, and journalists sometimes try to draw people uh, to care about climate change by scaring them. So you would use the scientific data to show that we're doomed and that the world is going to end in a couple of years because the emissions have risen. We won't be able to meet the Paris Agreement targets, and that that so that's that's not a nice way to attract people because if you if people become too scared of climate change and it becomes a depressing topic, they would avoid reading about it in the future. Because why would I read about a topic that basically makes me depressed? I want to be happy, and if we're doomed anyway, I should just try to enjoy the rest of my life. So what we usually tell people, and this is what's something that I usually try to do in my work is that I try to make people concerned, not scared, but concerned, and then offer solutions. So yeah, this is climate change, it's happening, and we need to do something about it. This is how I usually get to people. Okay, I, I see the one minute sign. So maybe you want to add something? Um... Yeah, I would say uh, just be try to be sensitive about how you communicate climate change. It's a major issue. It's a cat catastrophe. It's a crisis. But you also need to communicate it differently. You don't. You don't. You can't just develop one message and make and accept people to relate to that message. So that would be my advice for everyone communicating climate change across the world. Thank you so much. That was really really good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francois. Uh, Lena, I'll then pass you on to Hajar, and uh, you can ask her about uh, to describe herself. All right. Hi, Hajar. And I'm, I'm really happy that um, we we're talking together. We're geographically the closest. I really love Morocco. Uh, so could you please introduce yourself briefly and tell us about the situation of climate um, change in Morocco? Thank you, Lina. My pleasure. Well, I'm Hajar Khamishi. I'm an environmental engineer. Uh, I have been working uh, on sustainable development uh, since uh, more than 12 years ago. Uh, I have been actively involved within the, the uh, climate activism and uh, sustainable development, which hosts more than 800 associations uh, around, around Morocco. And uh, I co-founded uh, and was president of the Mediterranean Youth Climate Network, which was a network of uh, also NGO, youth NGOs and movements uh, uh, volunteering with uh, CARBON as Mediterranean coordinator, which is volunteer-based advocacy initiative promoting sustainable cities in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and since its founding, uh, CARBON has worked on promoting sustainability in cities, region, uh, through accessible research and innovative communication for civil society, for policymakers, to contribute to uh, to launch this dialogue between the three uh, three three the three sides from science policy and civil society uh, what well if we talk about morocco we're going to talk about what, what's happening in morocco it's also happening in all the MENA region we are hated severely by ongoing climate changes and this will be caused uh, this will be causing either increased average temperatures, less or more erratic precipitations, or changing patterns of rainfalls, and also continuing sea level rises and changing in water supplies, which is the rarest things in the region. Uh, well, uh, if we have to compare, I think Morocco has doing, uh, has doing quite good efforts concerning uh, the national policies on climate action. Uh, but, uh, however, these efforts are clearly insufficient to alleviate the degradations uh, which affect practically all natural resources and all protective sectors. Hence, 
uh, we can find uh, we can note uh, a significant gap between uh, the ambitious some ambitious policies and the local policies in how to local to localize the SDGs and these climate action policies. It's a really really big challenge in Morocco, knowing all the 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 in the political environment uh, ongoing. But we can, we can keep being hopeful so far. Yeah, exactly. Climate, like the climate movement is all about being helpful, uh, hopeful. And yeah. um, so from your work, I'm sure that you have um, communicated with multiple scientists, um, climate scientists specifically. So I, I was wondering, um, scientists are great at the job, but sometimes they're not the best um, communicators of science. So how well do you think scientists and engineers and other um, stakeholders related to climate science have uh, have done uh, in communicating the issue of climate change generally? Well, uh, communicating about climate change has its own uh, unique challenges from cutting through scientific jargon <laughs> in order to represent climate impact simply and faithfully to, to opening up conversation about climate solution to be more inclusive and accessible. However, scientists and engineers communicate through reports and speeches that are highly technical, <laughs> always technical scientific replete with the jargon and complex uh, terminology, largely incomprehensible from uh, lay to, to lay audiences. Because uh, mainly uh, on the surface, climate change communication is about educating, informing, warning, uh, persuading, mobilizing and solving this global emergency. But at a deeper level, uh, climate change communication is shaped by our, by our different experiences, uh, mental and cultural models, and underlying our values and worldviews. Yeah. So okay, and for sure, they need to do more efforts. OK, and so since you mentioned how complicated scientific data around climate change is, how do you personally or do you, how do you think ideally people should communicate um, scientific concepts to an audience that has very little scientific background? Uh, well, to someone uh, in the sciences, the theory is our current understanding of something. But to the most people, a theory is merely a conjecture. <laughs> it doesn't mean a lot to them. So though there are substantial issues concerning the public, uh, the public trust in science, as well as the health perception that climate change is only a distant threat. Uh, this, here's, here comes the role of the language we use, uh, metaphors, uh, words, uh, strategies, frames, and narratives in conveying climate change issues to, to different stakeholders, either public or policymakers. So we have to combine with narrative storytelling, make uh, vivid uh, through imagery, uh, experiential scenarios, balance with the scientific information and deliver trusted messengers in group setting because sometimes the messengers as as much importance as the message on itself. Uh, requests also audience feedback, like you said on your introduction uh, to revise and update messaging content and engagement activities to improve when things aren't going well. So to be really attentive to the feedback of the public. At Carbon, we are publishing regionally focused accessible articles and educational graphics on topics relating to climate action in cities, including sustainable urbanism and buildings, carbon emissions, climate change, resilience, renewable energy, energy efficiency, urban mobility, and different communication projects. We produce also short videos on uh, positive developments on the road to sustainability in the MENA region, uh, either land on the land generations, uh, waste management, water, urban, etc. But we made it very simple, very simple. We didn't make any, uh, the statistics were very uh, concentrated at no, and not long, uh, long sentences and long concepts. Uh, we made also short docu documentaries on urban mobility in Jordan and how it affects the, the social uh, the social part the social part uh, of the world and the inclusivity of it uh, we uh, address wider wider audience through local events uh, in different countries and newsletter and uh, what i like the most is uh, as i seem as we are designing cool <laughs> i call it cool uh, infographics 
uh, explaining graphically the fundamentals of energy use in the Arab region, uh, addressing topics such as uh, energy use, uh, water use, renewable energy, sustainable urbanism, energy use in buildings. So we make the infographics we made in really different than the classical infographics. It's uh, uh, they are more like fun to to see and uh, more expressive uh, to 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 read. So yeah. in pursuit yeah, about of uh, the sustainable, yeah. Yeah. It's all about making yes, the climate movement uh, basically cool. So uh, I was wondering, since you have communicated with those different audiences, um, how much do you think the local conditions impact um, um, impact the influence of the, your message? Do you think, uh, because the, the MENA region is mostly hot and dry, so do you think the messages are easier to communicate in, in such a in such a, um, a hot and dry um, country, or do you think um, that's not really relevant? Uh, audiences, audiences in developing countries generally do not need to be convinced that climate change is happening. They see the evidence bef before their eyes in uh, searing heat waves and increasing numbers of heat related illness and death in failing and floods, uh, flooded uh, food crops, uh, uh, increasing also e all the inundations on the coastal zones. Uh, what this audience needs is to make sense of what they are seeing. So to understand their lived experience in a scientific uh, context, to know what the future climates might hold and to decide on what they, on what they should do about it. Uh, they, they just need to make the connection between the big pictures or the big picture of, uh, and people's experience between scientific and local knowledge. So just make this connection uh, so uh, the, it's it's much easier afterwards. In developing countries, need to tackle persistent poverty and uh, basis development needs such as the provision of drinking water, sanitation, education, healthcare, housing, energy, which are needed for dignified life. And for most people in developing countries, action on climate looks very different uh, than it does in the industrial industrialized world where reducing over consumptions is the main towering challenge. Thank you so much, Hadjar. As a climate communicator and someone who works in this field, I really appreciate the work that you do, and I think it's fascinating. So I think the floor is yours and Joan now. Thank you so much, Lina. It's been a pleasure. So well, I hope Joan is unlocked from the big conspiracy from Zoom. Are you, Joan? <laughs> Fingers crossed. Are you here with us? <laughs> Hi, John. Can you, would you tell us something about you uh, and uh, what's the situation of, uh, I know you are working now in, you are, uh, you are working in the US, but you are back in Australia. So would you give us just a bridge of who you are and what's, what is the situation there? Sure. Um, I've just spent the last four years uh, working at George Mason University in the US. Uh, studying climate misinformation, understanding misinformation better, and developing ways to, to counter misinformation. Uh, and I just, uh, over the last few weeks, uh, relocated back to Australia. I'm, I'm now working at the Monash Climate Change Communication Research Hub. We're basically doing the same thing, um, working on the problem of climate misinformation and, and trying to just develop solutions to, to reduce the negative impacts that they have on society. Well, great. Uh, could you, John, could you explain us or give us uh, an idea about uh, the scientific consensus? How, how can you explain it? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I, I guess any conversation about scientific consensus should maybe start by uh, underscoring the fact that science um, is based on evidence. Our scientific understanding um, is based on observations and, and evidence that scientists collect. Uh, and, and that's kind of the foundation of, of all of the scientific method. Uh, but that said, a lot of psychological research has found that the general public um, kind of understandably don't have the resources to, to read all the scientific journals and, and take in all that scientific evidence. And so they have a very practical mental shortcut or heuristic for working at, or coming to positions on complicated scientific topics, they defer to the opinion of scientific experts. They look at what is the scientific consensus on an issue. Uh, and so in the case of climate change, um, 
right? Rather than read all the scientific journals, the general public will you know, ask, well, what is the scientific consensus about climate change? Uh, in 2013, I published a study finding that amongst climate papers about human-caused global warming, 97% of them uh, endorsed the fact that humans were causing global warming. Uh, and uh, the, the irony there was like our public paper was published, it got a lot of attention, but we weren't the first paper to find 97% consensus, not even the second paper. Mm. Um, but our paper got a lot of attacks because um, people who opposed climate action were determined to keep the public confused about consensus mm -hmm. in order to keep um, people um, confused about climate change itself and not supporting climate action. Uh, and so while uh, communicating climate change is a complicated issue and there are many things uh, we need to do to raise people's awareness of climate change and increase their support for climate action, one of the um, pieces of the puzzle is communicating the scientific consensus on climate change. Well, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, while reading this, your journey, uh, what are the most uh, frequent argue arguments that uh, you are faced with from climate change denialism? And uh, what are those that are the most difficult to answer? Yeah, so uh, we've been doing some machine learning research over the last few years, training a machine to categorize, automatically detect and categorize climate misinformation. And then we fed 20 years of climate misinformation into our machine uh, in order to build a history of, of climate misinformation. And the results really surprised us. We found that the biggest category of climate mis misinformation was actually attacks on climate scientists and on climate science itself. So it wasn't about arguing whether the greenhouse effect was real or whether global warming was happening. It was more about undermining public trust in climate science and climate scientists. Uh, and that's that was really surprised me um, because I think to answer your second question, one of the hardest things to respond to in climate misinformation is that, is attacks on science and scientists that undermine public trust. Um, and one of the reasons why is because there's just been so little research into how do we respond to attacks uh, on, on scientists, ad hominem attacks and, and casting doubt on the integrity of science. So that's, that's really an open, I wish I had a good answer to how to respond to that, but I think it's still an open communication question on the most effective ways to push back and try to neutralize attacks on science. Well, it is not, it's not easy, of course. And we, we saw that uh, in climate denialism is very different from country to another, from north to south, from developing country to developed countries. Uh, do you have any explanations to offer as for the differences between countries on climate denialism? Yeah, I, I have two major theories on the biggest drivers of, of um, climate denial in different countries. Although I think it was you that mentioned earlier the, the difference between theory <laughs> from a scientific point of view and a conjecture. I guess I'm talking more about yeah. it. <laughs> um, so uh, firstly, uh, the, the countries where climate denial is greatest tends to be uh, countries like the US, Australia, the UK, Canada, uh, New Zealand, uh, countries where uh, News Corp, where Murdoch media is, is very prominent. And so my suspicion is that, um, that uh, all the misinformation coming out through mainstream media in the Murdoch press is a contributor to denial. But there was a really interesting study published by some of my colleagues at the University of Queensland, um, Matthew Hornsey and Kelly Fielding, um, that looked at the degree of polarization in different countries. Uh, and they found that the countries that had the highest mix of fossil fuel energy in their country's energy mix were also the countries with the highest degree of polarization about climate change. And so their, um, their I guess, conclusion from, from that relationship was that fossil fuel funded misinformation was a big driver of polarization in, um, across mm. different countries. Yes, indeed, indeed. 
do you think that uh, those who argue uh, that development, developing uh, the economy is more important than the impacts of climate change should be referred as denialist? Because this is really fashionable. Yeah, I don't think that there is um, much, uh, I think, practical benefit to putting too much emphasis on labeling, like labeling people as denialists. Uh, the real question is, well, how do we um, how do we neutralize or respond to misinformation? Uh, and what my research has increasingly kind of pushed me towards is the way to counter misinformation is to basically inoculate people, build their pub, build their resilience by explaining the techniques used to mislead. Uh, and so when you encounter arguments like we have to choose between the economy or the environment, or, or just over the last 12 months, a very topical similar argument is we have to choose between the economy or, um, or public health in response to the... Um, COVID-19 pandemic. Both those arguments uh, commit the fallacy of false dichotomy or false choice, um, arguing we have to choose between one or the other when actually we need to choose both. You can't have a healthy economy without a healthy environment, just as you can't have a healthy economy without a healthy populace. Uh, and so I think that the, the, I think the most effective way to respond to misinformation targeting climate solutions is the same way to respond to misinformation targeting climate science, which is expose the or explain the techniques used to mislead. When people realize the techniques or when people are made aware of the techniques used to mislead them about climate change or climate solutions, that increases their resilience and they're less likely to be misled. Uh, yes, yes, and I think we have. There is a lot of work to do for all of us in that term, yeah, to 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 cut to cut off all these uh, these techniques and uh, work on a better future. Uh, thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure. The floor is yours. Well, the floor is mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Hajan, and thanks, John. Thank you very, very much. Um, excellent food for thought in all of those discussions. Actually, I think. That's what's important for us actually going into the breakout sessions uh, for those of us who are doing that. But we, we want to sit down and look at the, what things we can do rather than just summing up what the situation is, although clarifying that is always useful. But I think we have, what we have to do is sit down and look at a whole lot of issues that have been raised in those presentations and other areas as well that you want to cover. Um, and I think therefore that uh, I'm really looking forward to having these breakout sessions. They've proved very exciting. Uh, very, very good to meet people and to, to exchange views and it's, uh, they worked out very well, so I'm sure these will too. So I'll pass you back to, to uh, Aaron to actually uh, pick it up from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and to our fantastic panelists. And I want to thank our public audience for tuning in to this important discussion today. We'll be coming back in five hours at noon Eastern Daylight Time for our fifth session, which is on defeating vaccine hesitancy through communication. I hope you'll come back then. Um, and for the Congress participants, we'll now be moving over to our other link for our breakout discussions. Natalia, anything else? Just thank you all for being here again. And I hope to see you for a good vaccine discussion. I think it's the uh, hot theme of the hour. So hope to see you all there. Thank you again.